UCB Life Issues with Paul Hammond. And as always, a very warm welcome to this week's Life Issues. Now, let's be honest. During lockdown, or when the restrictions meant that we couldn't meet regularly in church, hands up anyone who occasionally thought it was quite nice to have a bit of a break from having to go every Sunday. Yeah, I know, I know, it feels awful to admit it, doesn't it? But, in truth, I think more than a few of us felt it. And this got us thinking here in the office about the way that we feel and think and relate to being a part of the community of believers in our church. I mean, what is church? Is it family, community, a place to nurture each other and encourage growth? Or a club we go to on a Sunday for an hour or two and then have a nodding acquaintance with everybody else who was there until the next meeting when we gather for a little while? Is it about doing life together and connecting with the message of Jesus for those who are around us? Or is it about keeping us happy? Is it, as I once read, about being a hospital ward where we can sit and lick our wounds and feel sorry for ourselves? Or a harbour where our nets are repaired before we launch out once more into the deep. The truth is, church can be any of those things. And in a world where the idea that you don't have to go to church to be a follower of Jesus seems, in the light of all that online church, to carry more traction than ever, perhaps the way we think about church will affect how much we value church, how much we love church, and how much we love the church. But if the Bible encourages us to function in fellowship, to gather together and to pray and to serve those around us in community, if it encourages us to be seen as a community whose light is revealed in how we love one another, maybe it's time for us to reevaluate whether I really am very glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord today. My guest to explore this this week is Rachel Jordan-Wolf. She is the Executive Director of Hope Together. Hope Together.org.uk is their website, an organisation that is committed to helping people find Jesus. But, Rachel, do they need to find church as well? Well, a great question, Paul, and my answer would be yes. Um, People need to find Jesus and then they need to find the body of Jesus. And we are the body of Jesus. Uh, We're his hands, his feet, we're his eyes, we're his mouthpiece. We're so many things that, yes, if people want to find Jesus and we want to introduce people to Jesus, we also need to introduce them to the church because we are the body of Christ. That's That's quite a big statement. I mean, that's a big implication there because just reading between your lines, it's almost as though you're saying that in real terms, We only function effectively, we only grow effectively, we only help one another effectively if we are in community. Would you say that's true? A hermit existence isn't for you then? That's certainly not for me anyway. If any, if you if you knew me, you'd know a hermit existence wasn't for me. But yeah, we are we're connected, we're part of a whole. That's that's the way that if you like, we've been designed. It's the way that the church has been designed. So you it, you know, if that there's so much in the New Testament, isn't there, about being the body of Christ, about being together, all those things. So yes, I I think we have to be connected. So I think obviously there will be circumstances in life. For example, if you were a prisoner and you were put into solitary confinement, then God is gracious. He is going to be there with you. He's not going to leave you on your own because, uh, you know, that that wasn't your choice. That wasn't the situation that you chose. But for most of us in the world, um, God has chosen that we work our faith out um, through being part of the body. Um, part of being togetherness and that's where it all happens if mm. you like and mm. um, that's where if you like almost the the drama of following Jesus is about um, being together and following Jesus as part of his body 
he modeled it, didn't he, really, by having his group of disciples. And that was amazing. If you think about how Jesus um, helped people to understand who he was, that the people he really worked with were those 12 people that he ate breakfast with, lunch with, dinner with, went on walks with, spent all that time with. That's where they really understood and, and got to grips with Jesus, the, the person who was teaching them who he was and what he wanted them to understand. So, yeah, I think he's got a great model there. I mentioned that you are the executive director of Hope Together, hopetogether.org.uk. Um, just unpack for us, and perhaps particularly within the context of what we're talking about today, what you are about and what Hope Together are about. Great. Well, um, we want everyone everywhere to know about Jesus. Um, and we really do believe that the local church, as I've just said, is the way that people are going to find Jesus. It's through people like you and me, uh, people in community um, that people find out about Jesus. Most people come to faith through um, a family member or a friend. That's that is the interface, if you like, that Jesus uses most of the time to introduce himself to others. Um, and so that's what matters. You can't just. Um, hope that somebody else is going to do this somewhere um, but actually again like the responsibility of being church comes down to all of us the responsibility of introducing new people to to Jesus is actually part of the whole of us together um, and so we're really um, passionate about helping local churches and Christians find ways um, and resourcing them with ideas and equipping them and doing this with them to help them to introduce others to Jesus and that might be as simple as um, you know having something in your handbag for when you have a conversation with somebody on a train as to happen to me the other day but I forgot to have something in my handbag I was very embarrassed that I did not have a hope book in my handbag at that moment so I just like to say I totally understand that sometimes we forget these things but I wished I had does that make sense yes. so I sat there and I thought I have nothing to hand this person um who sought me out and had a conversation with me and I so wished I'd had something for him to take a step further so it can be as simple as that or it can be in like in Bedford Town Centre there is an amazing hope space they have taken over a shop and they've created a space for hope on the high street where all different things happened. Um, it, it's a prayer space where people can find prayer, come and pray. There's art on Thursday mornings. There's a Bible study on Monday nights. There's food in the middle of the day. And that's becoming a real lighthouse in the middle of Bedford Town Centre. And that's a hope space. Um, and, and that's that's an amazing, if you like, that's a full on, we're going to do something that, with, with hope. Or it might be that you've got something in your bag that you hand someone on a train. So kind of a scale of all those things. And um, it does seem to me that a lot of that stuff is comes down to something being tangible, whether it's a, a booklet that you can hand yes. over, whether it's a, a plate of soup you can give to someone and sit opposite them and have one yourself and chat, whether it is to sit and slap some paint on a, on a, a piece of paper or whatever. There's a lot of tangibility about that. And I do, I do get a sense that maybe that's part of this thing about coming together in church is that it's mm. it's tangible it's concrete it actually happens rather than being something amorphous or something that's kind of vague idea that's held over there somewhere yet you can't get away from it when somebody's sitting opposite you yeah and that's completely true we did um basically we did some research just some time ago we're going to redo it this year called talking jesus and we looked at how people came to faith and it was just it, it it, it wasn't rocket science. Does that make sense? So it's things like having, a, like we're having a chat now. Conversations are really important. We learned that. Um, and one of the places we learn to grow in faith conversations is in church. Yeah. And then we'll be better at faith conversations when we're not in church. Um, so actually, like talking Jesus course, that's helping people in their church groups to practice so that when they're sitting on the train, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember I spoke about that. And that I could, I could talk about this, giving confidence. It's, so if you like, it's, um, yeah, we need each other. We need each other even in um, in, in mission because we can hone that together. We can pray for people together in mission. We can pray for, for five friends. We can talk about how that's going. Um, so, yeah, hope supports local churches um, because that's where we think um, that's the best place where people can meet Jesus is, is through the local church in that context. And that, again, is like, let's do this together. Oh, and we're very excited because we've got the Platinum Jubilee coming up next year. Uh, and we're going to create lots of resources because that's, again, local church, middle of the community. We can invite people in and they can experience church because we can put on community events that, again, so they're not just 
how are people going to meet Jesus? They're going to meet Jesus through you and through me. And that's like, if you like, how hope wants to help you and me to show Jesus to the world. And, and that happens best when we think about doing that together and we invite people into it, in to experience Jesus. So, yeah, that's an exciting thing that's coming up. You might be able to guess that she's quite passionate about this stuff. Hopetogether.org.uk <laughs> is the website. Hopetogether.org.uk. So then... As churches have been so disparate and sometimes literally unable to meet, have met online and so on, some people are struggling with the idea of getting back to church. And I've talked before to Hope Together about the idea of back to church Sunday and so on to encourage people who have fallen out of the way of going back to church. But one of the things that I've noticed is that even people who are committed to the idea of local church are committed to being a part of community i've had some of them saying to me but actually wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to go every sunday if we could have a, you know maybe maybe a couple of times a month or or maybe maybe do one online and one actually in and stuff like that. and there is a, a sense in which some people are either they're either afraid to go back or perhaps they're a little bit apathetic around the idea of active committed church participation why do you think it is particularly perhaps in the context of coming out of lockdowns that people have grown i, I hesitate to quote revelation but maybe lukewarm about church hmm Oh, I think there's a lot of things there. I mean, I'd like I'd, it'd be great. We we'll maybe have a conversation after this about online because I'm actually really committed that we stay online as well as we do in person. So that's a, that's another conversation we'll have in a minute. Um, but I think uh, for those of us who used to regularly come uh, pre-lockdown, now we've got quite used to online. Uh, some people are genuinely nervous about catching the virus and they need to stay away. Um, that's, that's what they need to do. We need to honour that decision and we need to just look after them. Uh, others can't come um, and actually have found online church really helpful because they, but for, for whatever reason, they are too elderly to get there or or or, or other reasons um, that, that they don't have the ability to get there physically, then it's really good that we have online for them. And that's why we do need to keep online. And online is amazing for mission. We'll talk about that maybe in a minute. But for the rest of this, do you know what? Hey, if you're going to even watch a streamed online service, a streamed online service is so much better if most people rocked up because you get that sense of that that you are you get the sense of joining in. Yeah. That you won't get if no one's there. So we did streamed obviously without people because there weren't anybody there, so we had to do it like that and we did lots of chat and stuff like that and that kept us connected. But even a streamed online service now is so much better if there are people in the building as well as people online, because there is that sense of gathering. And all through the Bible, God has been into getting people together. And my question would be, I think it's maybe, what does church mean to you? A bit like what you began with at the beginning. If it's a consumer experience where we go along uh, to um, listen to something that might help us, you know, are oh, we quite like that worship leader? So we'll rock up on this Sunday. Don't really like that speaker. So I might stay away this week. We might be tackling this from the whole wrong angle um, because really church is about family, a committed group of people. Now, you don't you don't look at your family gathering and go, oh, do you know what? I just don't think I'm going to go. Well, <laughs> don't think I'm going to go this time because so and so is rocking up. And I just there's something about family actually you know also you don't choose your family no that's true they're the chosen for you and church family is a bit like that you can you know no church is perfect let's just get that out there right away you're never going to find the perfect church because it's made of imperfect people and we're all on a journey being transformed by jesus and we actually need to realize that a lot of what church is what is what we're going to give is what we'll also receive. So not just, hey, I'm coming along to get this or this for me because we're a very consumer society, but what actually am I bringing? What am I giving? You will all know the times when you were doing something part of a team, you'll have felt more committed and involved in your church because you were doing something. You had a group of people to do something with. Uh, you'll all know that if you went for that church weekend away, everyone got to know each other so much better because you sat around the breakfast table, a bit like Jesus. You did breakfast, dinner, tea together. You went on a walk together. You got to know each other. Um, if you're part of a midweek group, it all goes deeper because you're looking after each other and someone's sick and they need this and this is happening. And I mean, 
all those things mean that you are um, much more deeply involved. We just did a holiday and took some of the church care on holiday with us. And it was all age. And, you know, you all learn how to wait for this person, uh, pick up this for this person. You know, your behavior is modified by yes. the fact there's a whole pile of you trying to do something together. And, and that's what church is about. If your behavior is never modified by your church experience, probably maybe you're not deeply involved, deep, not involved as in maybe you're not deeply embedded enough. I always think that the epistles um, don't make any sense, really. Like, why would you have to, if if all you do is rock up on a Sunday, it should be easy enough to forgive everybody for at least an hour on a Sunday. Shouldn't be too much to complain about. So that's obviously can't be what all the epistles are written about. The epistles are written to a group of people with a common purpose who are deeply involved in each other's lives. And that's why one person needs to submit. One person needs to forgive. One person needs to get over that grudge. Someone else needs to do this. They're really practical about doing life together. And so how we've, we've almost made church like like a bit of a consumer experience where we, we yeah. get a bit of this bit of a club a bit of that yeah a bit of a club so i'm not i don't want to say that of all churches i just we're, we're learning it's like we're relearning how to be church and we need to do that together the, the relearning of how to be family um and and that will cost you something it will be jolly inconvenient but it's worth it but i wonder if you see, there is an inclination, isn't there, more and more to isolation within society, Western society in particular. So now we we work remotely. We contact people from a distance. Families are, I mean, for many decades, we've seen a trend where families are separated further and further out. So grandparents and parents and mm-hmm. children are living further and further away from each other. We've had all this sort of individualization of society. And I wonder if that is also having an impact on the way that we think about our faith, that it is, becomes an individualised thing that doesn't really need anybody else. Because a lot of people will throw that, and, and perhaps today more than ever, throw that, it's about my personal journey of faith. I don't need to be part of church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, do you? Which is true in its in its narrowest form but it wasn't the invitation (laughs) that wasn't the invitation so like just a a a ticket a ticket to heaven was not the invitation the invitation was to a lifelong committed this walk of discipleship that costs um that actually was the invitation and um the cost is a lot the cost is on getting getting with other people and there's a lot of cost sometimes in that and doing this together. Um, and, and, and that is the New Testament church. When you read it, you reread those epistles and you know they were close to each other. But it is quite countercultural, yeah, isn't it? completely countercultural. Yeah. And I'm with you. I think that secular individualism um, is, is the thing. I mean, uh, I live in London and um, I look at all the tower blocks that go up and all the flats. They are not built for community living. Um, that you know and do you know it, you can I've lived on my own uh, for a time in my life and I found it really hard I am an extrovert I love people um, and I much much prefer living with with, with other people but sometimes that's quite hard because you, you especially here in London it's quite hard to find a home where lots of you can live together I can order my life when I live on my own I can watch what I want on the TV at the time I want to watch it. I can eat what I want when I want at the time that I want. I can choose who to see and who not to see. But in the end, we have a pandemic in this country that is different to the one we've just had. And it is a pandemic of loneliness. And the church's offer is incredible. The church's offer to the pandemic of loneliness is community yeah. and it is family. But it's like you can't, um, you know, what Jesus says it's like getting through the eye of the needle, a rich man. You can't bring your your isolated existence, dabble a little bit, grab a little bit of something which you have as a con- consumer eat called community and then walk off again. Um, you know, to make community work and to make family work, a church family, you, you kind of have to really move in. You may have to move into it almost. You have to be a part of it more than just on a Sunday um, for it to for, for it to really work and to have that that rub. And it's not just about 
being countercultural over individualism. It's also the selflessness of it. I mean, we do live in a society that encourages us to, you know, look first at ourselves. We are worth it, etc., etc., etc. But when you you live in church community, that encourages you to put others first and to see what you can give, not just what you can take. And again, it. It's quite countercultural, but like the point you made about loneliness, there are an awful lot of people who are despairing because of the selfishness of the world that's around them. And the slightest hint at selfless, charitable activity, people rejoice over it. Yeah, it's true, completely true. And it's um, uh, we, we've been sold all this. <laughs> we, we've been sold all this in, in so many ways and through so many channels. So it's like, don't beat ourselves up about it, but it is take off the glasses of the world and you put on the glasses of Jesus and you do see a radical challenge to the culture around us. You see a radical challenge to the culture around us because it goes against self. That That is the whole thing, isn't it? If Jesus says, come to me and actually saying, will you die to self? That's the invitation. It's a really radical invitation. Will you die to self when you come to me and let let me take over your life? And I will ask you to do things that, quite frankly, you 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 don't really want to do. They don't seem to go along with with the, with the dominant view of the world or the culture around us. So you do end up having to take a cultural ca- uh, countercultural narrow path. But actually, that narrow path leads to life, and it leads to flourishing and it leads to goodness and it leads to all the things that people desperately need but they it's like the signposts in life have been changed so there's a big signpost saying happiness and we we follow the signpost that says happiness but actually it's led people to isolation and loneliness and actually to depression and it's got to be flicked around it's actually the other direction you want to travel in which is um giving up of yourself not so there is there's a real um there's some real cultural battles here that we are dealing with and as churches we're dealing with them all the time as we get together in community how how do we do this actively what does that really look like how do I get close enough to people to do this what I don't want to you know all collapse and have everybody burning out either so it's how do we make it function we found here and so I'm I'm married to um Darren and uh, he's a the the church leader here we uh, have and we discovered that a lot of people want to live in community Um, and so trying to facilitate that so we live with three guys from church Darren and I could live on our own and it would all be a lot neater and I wouldn't have to buy so many bananas Um, you know to live with three guys who are in their young 20s they they can't tell you how many bananas or the bins I just thought oh can somebody you know the number of times you have to empty the recycling bin but on the other hand, they give back. So, you know, actually, they can go out and buy the bananas. Um, but but we, we've lived in community because we really believe that's, that's where it matters. If you're going to disciple a generation, the best way is to live with them, mm. just like Jesus. It's very full on, but it's lovely. Um, and then we've got another house that is amazingly God helped us to get that a other group of guys wanted to live in community and they live in that house in community. And then there's another house around the corner that's become there's a group of girls in, in that house. And it's like it's small. And then other people can go around that satellite of those of that community, those communities. And I think mixing up the ages so that we don't church often we do everything in very segregated ages but i'm sure there's some power when we get together and you see that, you're kind of leaning towards my next question then because i mean you what you talk about and this sort of countercultural satisfying life-giving experience that church can have in in truth rachel you and i have been knocking around church life for more than a couple of weeks now and the mm. truth is in some churches, there are some very miserable people who are very dissatisfied about their church. Is part of the problem that we are, and I don't say this in a, a judgy way of other churches, because this is probably as relevant to my own church as it is to yours, but is there a point at which we have to recognise, happen we're doing it wrong? And the way that we've done it year after year after year, that maybe we need to, we need to kick that out of the park and find a new ball. Well, I think what we need to realise is that Sunday morning is a great starting place, but that's all it is. So if we're trying to look 
So Sunday morning for an hour and a half to be everything, it's never going to be everything. It just can't do it. There's just no way that can be everything that God is asking of us to be church family or follow Jesus. It just can't. So um, it's a bit like, oh, we kind of go along and punch, we get our ticket. And 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 it's a really great. Um, we always say sort of thing. It's like a, it's a starting place. It's a, it, it, I think it's also a great shop window. It's a great place to invite people to. It's good for it to be as best as it can be. So that you, you know, and as 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 good as it can be. But it, it's only to start. So it's not really the whole. It's like um, how can I put it? I want to say it's sort of the, the thing at the front, but it's like a little tip of an iceberg. But the real piece of church is underneath. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we could keep swapping that bit, trying to make it work, but I don't think it's really what it's all about. This is a, it, 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 it's functional, it's okay, it, but it's not really what it's all about. It, it's but you see, that's, the, that's the thing, isn't it? That in a lot of churches, um, going to church on the Sunday is, it's the start, but it's also the finish. And although there may be some elements of community during the week, in the main, it is... It's an isolated thing. We go along, we wave at people, then we go our separate ways until we come together again next week. And and that's what I'm asking you. Are you suggesting that perhaps the the reason that we don't love church, the reason that we are happy to just go, oh, we'll go online, or we are happy to go, hey, let's not um let's not bother meeting apart from every other week or once a month, is because we have lost that essence that would give us a passion. Not that we have to work up the passion, but it would give us a passion for our local church because we would actively be meeting together to love one another, not meeting together just to tick a box. Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think it's where are your deepest relationships? Um, so we look at, I was thinking about that passage, Hebrews 10, about don't give up meeting together, but spur, you know, you need that, that place where you spur one another to good works, you encourage one another. Uh, you know, are you near and are you close enough to people in your church that you can have deep and accountable conversations? Do they know what's happening in your life? Would somebody challenge you if you were about to do something that was definitely not what Jesus wanted? Um, you know, is that happening? Have you have you got that level of relationship? And then you want to be with those people. Admittedly, once you get that close, it, you know, you've got things to deal with. But yeah, Sunday is just, hey, then we all get together, we see each other, that's great. And then you've got these deeper groups within it. So Sunday is a bit like festival and it's great and that's lovely and we can all get together. But actually the life bit is those groups of people where you where the where the rub where the rubber hits the road and we definitely need to invest in those. And then of course you want to go to church because you really want to see those people and hear from God and you want someone who's going to pray for you. And when you hit a crisis, they're the people that you're going to turn to. So there's something about building family. And we were discussing it. How do we build um, what what size is an optimum size for church family? So you can have festival. And then how do you build church family? What what size would that look like? How could you get that to go a, a bit more flex across ages and things so that there's both children and adults in that church family size? Um, and how do you invite other people into that then? Because that's a really attractive place to be. So, yes, I think. We could swap the Sunday morning a thousand times over, but it's probably not the thing. It's the festival showcase and it's great. Let's have it good. Let's have it so that we can feel confident to invite a non-Christian into it. But then you're inviting them to the back piece. You're inviting them into this is the front door. But hey, there's this whole house. Mm. So, yeah, Sunday morning. There we have got my analogy. Sunday morning is a beautiful front door. It looks attractive and it's great. And you are confident to invite your friend into the hall. But when they get into the hall, they discover the rest of the house, which is deep relationships, people who do life together, people who pray for each other, people who believe in each other, people who, how are you going to spur one another on to good works? Not just through a, the, the, the front door Sunday's talk, but through all the nitty gritty bits in between. Um, and I think that's what the, the I think that's what we're all longing for. When you talk about being counter cultural, it's that level, that depth. 
This is supposed to be brother and sister. This is supposed to be family. It's the church family that we're supposed to be wanting to die for, mm. be next to. I mean, that's what the early church would have done. You know, they, they were going through severe persecution. They knew who their friends were and they had to really rely on each other. It's like, how, how do we get that level of, uh, how do we get that level of belonging? Because maybe if we could find that level of belonging, then that would actually give us recognizing that we love the church. It would give us a passion for the activity of church, recognizing that we connect with the people and that they connect with us would give us passion for the activity of expressing that in a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening or a, or a well, anything that expresses it really. And how does that influence and speak into the idea of online church, offline church, community activity that is reaching out to the community that's around us. So it's not just about us inwardly looking, sort of spiritual navel gazing, licking our wounds because of the, the rotten old world that's out there. But it is about that image of mending our nets so that we can launch out once more onto the deep. Yeah. And you know what? Online is a good thing. So let me just say that again. Uh, we discovered 23 percent of the population um, joined us online during the pandemic. That's massive. Four uh, percent of the population joined church online during the pandemic regularly. Many of those have now rocked up to join us in person. And that's because the front door was amazing. And when they walked into the hall, they discovered up and down the country, incredible communities of people who love and follow Jesus and put that into practice. So I don't want to be down on the church. We we had something amazing during the pandemic. We 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 flexed and we were flexible. We were in creative. We were incredible. And we went online en masse, which is also really important. It wasn't just one church that went online. Uh, when you go online to search for, I don't know, buying flowers or, or, or a new... Um, gym bag you'll find many different ways of finding the right gym bag or a thing of flowers and that's why it was so exciting that so many churches went online during the pandemic because there were all these different ways for people to find a community or the body of Jesus all these different ways reflected online and people loved it and they loved us and they discovered as they walked through the front door of the house of the church they saw something beautiful so we need to do positive messages to, to the church and to church leaders who have done so much during this pandemic to get us online. But we need to keep the front door online. We need to be able to invite. Um, so I didn't have a booklet in my bag when I spoke to the man on the train, but I told him he could go on YouTube and he could watch our church on Sunday. He was like, oh, yeah, that's great. Great. I'll do that. Now, whether he does or not, I don't know. But one easy way to discover what we do, who we are, how it feels like. We've then had people rock up who did that. Then they come along and they feel like they know you because they've seen you. Uh, they, they know who you are. You've got no idea who they are. But you have to remember they've been watching you for three months. So they feel pretty integrated. Um, and then you can integrate them into the church. And some people might even do online small groups. You could still do depth. You could encourage one another on to spiritual uh, maturity in an online small group. So it's not that the online is a bad thing. Mm. It can be part of the whole growth of that, of the underneath the iceberg, or if you like the back of the church. So you've got a front door and a hall. That's wonderful, but that isn't the whole of church. And even online, you can have online places where people can grow and develop. So I'm not actually anti online. Um, I think it really has a place alongside the rest. And I'm definitely not anti church. I think, I think we so need church and church leaders have done so well to take us online. But we, I guess we need to pray for a fresh renewing and anointing of the spirit that gives us such a love for each other. We need a lot of grace at this time. Everyone's a bit worn down. Everyone's had a rough year. So we need lots of grace and we need to look out for each other. And we need to, you know, that's that like carry one another's burdens. Mm. And we need to do that in church. But as well, there is this sense where by being a part of it, it opens, I mean, the, the intent of God in creating church was that we would be nurtured, would be that we'd be encouraged, would be that we'd be supported, mm -hmm. would be all those things, absolutely. But there's also a part of it where 
there was a, a, a while in, um, for a variety of reasons, not because we fell out with anybody, but for a variety of reasons, we were looking for a church to be a part of. And during that process, there were a few months where, in truth, it was easier not to be a part of church. One of the things that struck us was when you talk to someone, when you find someone who needs help, when you find someone who is facing maybe a, a, a major issue that requires real practical help and maybe they I don't know maybe they need furniture for their house or or whatever when you come across that it's really hard to do anything with that and show God's love in that situation if you're on your own if you're part of a community many hands and all that sort of thing Oh, completely. And I've seen that time and time again here. I won't give all the examples, but there's one recently where uh, someone who very recently joined our church and then that yeah hit quite a rough patch of something. And just all the ways that together, the family of God, I mean, seriously, it could make me cry, but the family of God together has, has come in to sort that out. It's, it's awe-inspiring. And it's a story that nobody will probably will ever know. Because you're not going to actually put all that up no, there no. or out there or say this is what we did. And sometimes you're like when when people uh, when people like want to want to criticise a church, you're like, oh my word, do you have any idea of the number of people that are being picked up, scooped up, helped in in so many different ways? And um, that all the moments of grace and love and encouragement that are happening, um, the stories would be incredible and endless. But you can't sort of publicise all those stories. So I think you're right. It's really hard to do. And and you would get pretty exhausted on your own. Mm. But when you do it together, you, you're, you're, when you're carrying these things together, it helps you to go for longer. Um, and, and that's so important. So I think we need each other to do good. It's like that spurring one another on to good works. We'll do it better together. So we will love God better together. We will carry each other when one of us falls down life is not easy things are going to go wrong and you are going to need running partners and God in his great wisdom created the church to be those running buddies to be the person when it's tough and to be the person when it's good and maybe it's good for you then you pick up the person when they've fallen down and then when you fall down they're going to be there to help pick you up and um, that is the joy and beauty of the church so as we look to the future and as we have, I think it's fair to say, seen a real challenge to what church can be and challenge to what church has been. For people who are listening to us today and going, oh, but that's all well and good, Rachel, for you. Your church is obviously ticking all the boxes. It's obviously doing really well. It's living in community. It's reaching out into its community. It's obviously got resource and people and all that. Yeah, that's great. But you don't know what it's like where I am. I'm just getting nothing out of it. I'm really just not, it's not working for me at all. I'd be better off sitting at home, listening to UCB or just listening to a worship tape or watching your church on YouTube. What would you say to them? I would say that, well, um, you know, whichever one it is, you've got to find, uh, you've got to find those running buddies. Now, what does that look like where you are? So, even if you chose to watch any church online, who could you watch it with? Can you can you watch it with someone else? So you've, you've got two choices. You can either go to a church that's near you, which is number one, which I think would be a great idea, and, um, and, and get committed and help to make it that body of Christ expression that you're longing for. That is what I would say. Um, the perfect church doesn't exist. Uh, but the church that is best for you is the one that you just put your, put your shoulder in uh, and, and, and get immersed in it and, and find the people who could make a difference with you. Um, and if that's not right, well, you've got the other option. Yeah, you could be a little, you could start growing your own church if you really want to. Uh, you can lead a church and you can, and you, <laughs> if you've got, if you feel like you've really got the commitment time to do that, you could start a church where you are um, and draw others in. And you could maybe watch some things together and start praying for each other. But do you know what? In this country, there's quite a lot of churches already. Um, and so before you start deciding to lead your own, I think really 
um, trying to get in there. None of us are perfect. Our church is not perfect. Um, but our church is a place where everybody, you know, the call is come and get committed. Every, t- every Sunday we say, you know, Sunday is not the life of our church. But our midweek groups are the life of our church. That's where we encourage one another. That's where we get to know each other. That's where we do life and commitment. And we ask people to get involved in those groups because that's where the rubber hits the road. And and that would be my first port of call. Don't just go on a Sunday. Go get stuck into a life group, midweek group, home group, whatever it's called. and, and, And then see if after six months of that, you haven't changed your mind. Do you know what I worry? I worry that following on from all those months when we couldn't go to church, when we were forced to be isolated from one another, even though perhaps we were part of serving our community and taking of food parcels and so on, but we weren't able to really sit down together and engage with one another and talk to one another. What I worry is that we've kind of got into the habit of that. And the danger is that we stay in the habit of that because we forget how good community really can be. Good at building us up. Good at showing to the world around us the reality of Jesus in us because of the love that we have for one another. Good at encouraging us when we are feeling weak. Good at pulling us up when we are inclined to do that, which is not good for us and which is wrong. And the worry is that we get so used to, we become so adapted, because we are very adaptable creatures, aren't we? We become so adapted to the idea of just muddling through. We forget the richness that is available if we will commit ourselves to church. And if your church, your situation, doesn't inspire you to actually get involved again then maybe what we need to do is remember what can be and commit ourselves, like Rachel says, to grow that there and be a part of nurturing that there. Because the truth is, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he didn't send them out on their own. He sent them out in groups so that they could be, as Rachel put it, running buddies. And maybe that's the passion that we need to find for our church that we can be running buddies for those who are there and let them be the running buddy for us. Love your church. Find a passion for it. Not because it is the be-all and end-all, but because it opens the door to a community that will bring a transformative difference to those who are hurting, aching and feeling the need for God's love. Rachel Jordan Wolf is the executive director of Hope Together, hopetogether.org.uk. Rachel, great to speak to you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been a privilege. You've been listening to UCB Life Issues. I'm Paul Hammond. Don't forget you can hear this as a podcast wherever you download yours or on the UCB Player app. And why not join me next week for another Life Issues. Good night. Good night.